Right. Hi, I'm Soren, and I am a inclusive and accessibility designer. Uh, I use they them pronouns, and I live just outside of New York. Great. Thank you. And can you tell me a bit about your disability or disabilities that you identify with? Oh yeah, that might take a while. Uh, <laughs> I um, I found out that I was uh, that I had ADHD in uh, probably about like 2013. Uh, so a pretty late stage diagnosis. I was already in my in my 30s when I was diagnosed. And then uh, in, a, in 2016, I started losing my vision and uh, found out that I had a degenerative eye disease, which uh, I've had a lot of surgeries for, but uh, I still identify as visually impaired because I don't have full use of my vision. And um, let's see, I'm also autistic, which I was diagnosed during the pandemic which was a very interesting experience being, uh, you know, like away from everyone else when I got that diagnosis and not having that support system. Uh, I'm also type one diabetic. So that, that has been with me since I was 13 and I've been on a insulin pump and a continuous glucometer for a while. So. I, I often feel like I'm part cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would say that all of these things do affect the way that I access design and also the way that I design. Great, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so when I found out I was losing my vision, I went through a period of time where I was having a lot of surgeries done and I found out that uh, I would have to learn how to use assistive tech, which was uh, kind of a scary proce uh, process because I was not really sure, uh, you know, like how to, use a, how to use a probing cane. I was not really sure how to, you know, use voiceover. So I really tried to like study up and learn how to use these things before it became like an absolute necessity. And what I found was that when using a screen reader, that most of the things that I relied on, like apps and websites were not accessible with a screen reader. And that was a, a really big wake up call for me because I, I was all of a sudden just like thrust upon with the knowledge that I wouldn't be able to use like half the internet if I could not use my vision. And uh, so from that point on, I, I was really passionate about learning about accessibility and I got into learning about like how it would affect other disabilities and uh, like just really trying to learn best practices so that then I could change things. Um, and I saw that, you know, as my vision got a little bit improved that I didn't have to use a screen reader all the time or I, I could use it just like when I was having uh, surgeries, but I still have to use like magnifiers and, and sometimes if my eyes are really tired, I have to still use the screen reader and that gives me the ability to like keep sharp and test things. So um, if, I, if I do need to like test a website or jump into uh, voiceover really quick, then it's, it's very easy for me to do so. But um, yeah, I, I just had this, this realization and then it was like, I just couldn't go back to designing the same way or to not learning about how my design affected other people. And that led to like the inclusive design part of it too, because I was just like, there's no way to unravel all these different identities from each other. Mm -hmm. It's very much, um, it's very much a intersection of how these different identities affect us. Like someone that has anxiety versus somebody that's, uh, you know, has a mobility disability, they view accessibility very differently. And th like the solutions for them are gonna be very different. Yes, I love that. Um, can you tell me more about uh, using, a screen, uh, using a screen magnifier and having to use design softwares? Cause I'm really curious how well you can design when you are limited by your screen view. 
Yeah, I would say that there's definitely been a lot of workarounds that I've had to learn. There was a period of time where I couldn't do visual design, so I was mostly just uh, giving like consultations on things. Uh, but I would say that there's definitely some softwares that are easier to use than others. Uh, I would also say that there's definitely some operating systems that are easier to use than others. So I found that like Apple um, infuses a lot of accessibility into their products. And that was really like the best operating system for me to use both on my phone and on my computer so that I could have uh, more accessibility options. And there's, uh, there's definitely like a lot of time that I feel like I, I lose by using a screen magnifier, like zooming in and out when somebody else might not have to. I also use a really huge monitor, which does help because I can make things very large um, and much more easily viewable. Uh, but there's some other blind designers and illustrators that I know as well that they, they basically operate by magnifier. So huge screen, lots of uh, peripheral support, and then using uh, the built-in accessibility options. I would say it's a lot better than it used to be, mm -hmm. uh, the accessibility options that are available, but it definitely does have an impact on how I design and uh, can can lead to some issues when I'm, when I'm uh, doing like a lot more UI design and, and visual design because um, if if I'm not if I'm not able to to get the the equipment that I need mm -hmm. at a job site then it's sometimes very hard to deal with um, uh, being a contractor I've got, definitely gone into some job sites where there's not a big enough screen or there's not um, the support that I need to to get accessible options yeah, have you found that um, working remote has been more helpful to you um, with the pandemic that's gone on? Yeah, definitely. I, I started working remotely right before the pandemic because of, like I've worked in distributed teams before and I've also worked like hybrid or part remote before. Uh, but going into the pandemic, I was already working remotely because I was working for a company that was full remote. And that was just completely different because I was able to set up the screens how I like it. Like I'm able to um, have my home office set up that has like the good lighting and everything for the high contrast. Um, I'm able to keep my equipment calibrated so that it's ideal for me. So I would say that remote working has like completely changed the way that I operate and has just like completely opened up a lot more comfortable worlds for me. Yeah. Um, I know at least uh, with me, I, I have a lot of open questions when it comes to asking employers for a different accommodations. Is there any advice that you would give to someone who's seeking accommodations from their employers? Yeah, I would say that um, a lot of people don't want to give accommodations unless you have, you know, like some official letter or diagnosis or something like that. But I would, I would encourage people that you should push for uh, not really requiring that documentation always to, to get accommodations, because if people need what they need to work best, uh, whether that be remote work or the right equipment, I think, you know, whether or not someone has a formal diagnosis is, uh, irrelevant like that if it's what they say they need we should believe them and give them what they need to do their best work uh, now of course like if they say they need something absolutely ridiculous like i need gold-plated pens that's obviously like not uh, always an accessibility concern but um i think within reason we can we can see what is uh, an accessibility need and what is uh like an outlandish request. Oh, uh -oh. What? Just be supported to do their best work, and however that that happens is is um, shouldn't be dependent on a medical model of disability, where you have to get a doctor to certify and say, yes, they they deserve to have these supports. 
right we cut out a little bit there but i'm hoping we caught most of it um so fingers crossed <laughs> i may ask for some clarifications later <laughs> sure <laughs> um so it was really wonderful i do appreciate that uh in that same topic is there something that you wish employers would do to be more inclusive yeah, I would say besides just um, giving people the supports that they need without that medical model of disability, um, I would say that, you know, like thinking outside the box about uh, like who has who has access to these supports, um, like it's a lot easier for people that are uh, white and heterosexual and cisgender, able-bodied to get access to accommodations like um, even a schedule accommodation, like I need to pick my kids up at uh, three o'clock every day. So I need to go uh, like have an adjusted work schedule. Like those things are more easy for people that are uh, not marginalized to access. So I would just like keep in mind that oftentimes we don't know what somebody is really going through or like what they need. And so that trust aspect, and that's that's a problem that a lot of people have with remote work, right? Is that there's a lack of trust and uh, that people will actually do work. But I think that, uh, you know, no matter where someone is, if they want to be there and they want to contribute, that they will and they'll find a way to do it. And giving them what they say they need to do that work is really, really important. So that trust aspect really needs to be there. I really love that. And that's always been something that's been very confusing to me over the years. Um, the idea that if you're not in the office, then you're not able to work. Uh, you know, when I, I, I always found it much easier to work, you know, on my own and be heads down and to be able to get work done and crank through it when I wasn't in the office and getting distracted by everyone that was popping in to say hello or ask questions. So it was just, it was always a very confusing concept to me, but I am I think that's at least one silver lining that came out of the pandemic is that we were all forced to work remotely and therefore realized that work still went on. <laughs> People still yeah. worked. <laughs> I would say too that like that, that idea of people like popping in or uh, like being uh, distracting can still be absolutely possible during a remote work. Like we have Slack and there's tons of notifications and people can call you. And uh, so I would say that that's not removed. I think it's easier to have boundaries though and to set up boundaries for yourself, like to put notifications on do not disturb or to say like, these are the hours that I would like to meet with you. So it's just very much more intentional about our interactions and our boundaries. And I think that that can be really good for people, both like socially and also from an accessibility standpoint. That's a great note. That's wonderful. Um, okay. Is there anything that you wish more designers adopted into their design practices or designs themselves? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of accessibility pitfalls that I feel like we run into very easily. Uh, there's, there's a lot of times where I really wish that people would test things or at least like, at least during the discovery process to, to include people with disabilities and the creation. And I think one of my favorite examples of course is like the Twitter voice tweets. Uh, there, it was very obvious when that launched that there had been nobody involved on it that had a disability because they were like, well, we came up with this great animation, but we didn't do captions. So you see this great visualization of the voice tweet, but you know we don't have the ability to do captions for people that are hard of hearing or deaf. And that to me was just like such a obvious and missed opportunity to really bring accessibility to, to voice tweets and to also uh, be able to expand like what's possible with social media because uh, you know we're like really exploring all the different ways that we can interact with each other. And uh, I think that, you know, that could have been a great product if they had built in that accessibility portion, which I think they've really tried to do with Twitter spaces. So uh, you know, there's just like different things where I, I see that and I go, oh, it would just be so easy just to either if you don't know enough to learn about it or to include someone that has a disability in the process. Because I think that even though I don't have every disability, 
I am much more sensitive to the needs that people have. And I know how to like quickly research and get to the bottom of like, what is the essential accessibility supports that we need to have for each product. Great. And uh, for those that maybe don't have access to someone with disabilities um, and don't know where to start, where would you recommend that they start their accessibility journey? I would say that learning is is a really great uh, way to do that. And if you're having questions about access to people with disabilities, there's even like testing groups like Fable that um, will provide a vetted list of people to test for you. So you can just like have them do your testing. Um, it's very much like usertesting.com, but for people with disabilities. So I, I would say there's a lot of resources out there to either learn more about accessibility, like even um, LinkedIn Learning has some great courses and uh, like Coursera Interaction Design Foundation. So there's a lot of learning that can be done out there. And then there's also just a lot of resources that if you have the budget to include people and to, to hire them uh, to, to work with you, then I would absolutely do that. That's a great place to get started because you'll learn so much just by going through the testing and seeing all the places where you might have missed something. Love this and a great shout out for Fable as well. Fantastic. Um, all right, I think that's all of my questions for today. Is there any last parting thoughts that you would like to uh, include? Yeah, I would say that for accessibility, it's, uh, it's not really so much only a legal issue or a business case issue, but it's also the right thing to do. And I, I think that a lot of people lose track of that when they start getting into the business case of, you know, like why it's profitable to include people with disabilities. And uh, I think that people should keep in mind that it's also a human rights issue. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this.